Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks to uh, Drager staff uh, to uh, allow us to be here with you and to speak uh, about uh, the protective ventilation both in pediatric and in uh, adult obese patients. This is my conflict of interest. And then I um, try in the next uh, 15 minutes to convince you that in anesthesia that the ventilation is very important and we have the lucky to be prevention in this situation and try to convince you that prevention is better than cure in especially in this care. Just to remember for the more younger in the room that two main objectives you have when you use mechanical ventilation in a patching room. First of all, you should ensure the gas exchange, mainly oxygenation and ventilation during the surgery procedure. And now you should absolutely limit the risk of postoperative pulmonary complication. And to do this, you should optimize the ventilatory setting. This is very important. And now the background about what is the prevention by protective ventilation. Protective ventilation included three components. If you do only one or two or uh, one of us, it's not possible. You should apply the limit tidal volume. You should apply an optimal PIP, we we'll discuss uh, what the level of each, and an optimal recruitment maneuver. And this is in the aim to avoid the occurrence of postoperative pulmonary complication, such lung injury and uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then, how it works? As presented nicely by Ravier previously, it's very similar. As you know, the concept is too simply to avoid large tidal volume and then to avoid high airway pressure. At the same time, you should avoid alveolar collapses, that means atelectasis, and then it means that you should open the lung and keep it open. You should then limit the tidal volume to avoid the barrow and volo trauma, then I will convince you that now we absolutely should change your paradigm and use more um, low tidal volume between 6 to 8 ml per kilogram of predicted body weight. And to avoid alveolar collapse, you should absolutely use PIP. Why mean change the paradigm? The change the paradigm because more than 30 or 40 years, we did not use PIP in operating room. In fact, if you use PIP, you should decrease tidal volume because you should always, always speak the couple PIP and tidal volume. If you maintain the same tidal volume and you add PIP, you increase air pressure. If you add PIP but you decrease tidal volume, you maintain a similar mean air pressure. That's very important. Why uh, to better uh, explain that the PIP is not harmful? It's helpful if you only decrease tidal volume. This is a slide which summarizes the main modification of the respiratory function during surgery, mainly during surgery near the diaphragm, that means abdominal surgery or thoracic surgery. As you know, you induce mainly a restrictive syndrome of all volume, uh, such uh, tidal volume, such uh, functional residual capacity, all volume decreased, and then you have a vicious circle with uh, a diaphragm dysfunction, atelectasis, and this vicious circle is maintained. And this is harmful by the risk of hypoxia, uh, and then the respiratory failure, and the respiratory failure make the bed of the pneumonia. A. And then also, in some times, you can add the harmful fluid overload. You should absolutely cut this vicious circle to decrease the respiratory complication. What about the obese patient? This is general for what uh, I said. But the obese patient are population at high risk for increased morbidity. As you see here in the y-axis, you have the odd ratio in comparison to uh, body mass index of a patient between 80 to 25, that's called normal. And more the BME increase, more you increase the morbidity of postoperative period. The same is true for mortality and especially for the mortality controlled for the same risk. 
that means the population of obese is really at risk of surgery after a BMI more than 35. We don't have time to discuss about the paradox syndrome of obesity, but uh, I think after 35 uh, BMI, it's at risk. These are patients uh, that we manage in our unit to show you that it's probably the, the bariatric surgery is, uh, th it could be very good for a patient. Um, it's, he allowed us to show you uh, the, his uh, image. And then, as you see, after nine months, uh, nine months sorry, the, you have an improvement of the apnea syndrome, an improvement of respiratory function, a new job, a new car, a new wife. This is absolutely a, probably a primary endpoint for this type of surgery in this situation. Then, I try to convince you now that it's time to change your paradigm then you should absolutely now change your practice. That means 10 milliliters per kilogram for all patients, no PEEP. This should absolutely change. Now we have clinical evidence that is no good, and you should absolutely incorporate the uh, concept of protective ventilation. Coming from ICU, and then we change from anesthesia to ICU, and vice versa. We developed with uh, our team, with uh, mainly my colleague uh, Emmanuel Futier from uh, Clermont-Ferrand, the concept of the POP ventilation. The POP is very easy to remember. It's a positive perioperative protective ventilation, and then it's funded of the open the link and keep it open during all the perioperative period. This is absolutely new. What means? That means probably you should maintain it open during the surgery proce procedure, using the bundle of the free compartment, that means a limited tidal volume, a PEEP, and recruitment maneuver, but you should start at the end of the anesthesia procedure, because when you perform the induction of anesthesia, you induce atelectasis, and probably you are full at the start of uh, this procedure. And after surgery, you should absolutely try in obese patient more and more, to maintain the lung open by using positive pressure, mainly by CPAP or non-invasive ventilation using BiPAP, that means two pressure. This is very important. And this bundle was uh, now um, published clearly and applied in different uh, country. And uh, this is a start early at uh, the induction of anesthesia. Why it's very important to increase the oxygen storage for obese patient? Because the obese patient, is sometimes like the baby, like the pediatric patient. The time for the oxygen desaturation is very faster. And this is due by this very simple and nice uh, um, uh, slide uh, by the study performed by Paolo Pellozzi. In the Y axis, you have the lung volume or oxygenation. And as you see, more you increase the BMI, more you decrease the lung volume as shown here. That means for more the, obese is, the patient is obese, you have less time for the desaturation because you have less lung volume. And then you have the atelectasis, which is the main cause of the hypoxemia. It's shown in the different studies. This is a f different study. shows that the BME is probably one of the main factors of Difficult intubation, but, but more vent difficult ventilation, which is more uh, harmful. And then, as you see in the different study, we find this. And then in, our, in this study that performed in uh, our uh, hospital, we mix it all the data given from ICU, given from the database of all the operating room of our four department in Montpellier University. And then, as shown here, we compare the intubation procedure in anesthesia, in operating room, and in ICU. And in a simple way, in YFCs, you have the several complication. As you see, if the patient is obese and is intubated in ICU, the risk to have a complication is more than 50%. This is very important to see that the difficulty to manage this type of patient. And we developed a score, which is validated in also in this type of patient, which is called the MACOCHA score. 
What happened? In fact, as you see here, for the pre-oxygenation, you increase the oxygen storage. For example, if a healthy patient in ambient air, you have 100 mm per mercury. After oxygenation, pre-oxygenation using a standard oxygen balloon, you could reach more than 400. However, in a lung injury or in obese patient, which is very similar, you have and hypoxemia before and after three to four minutes per oxygenation, you could only reach probably not more than 100. That means the delay, classically of five to six to eight minutes of the saturation observed at 92% will reduce less than one minute. And then you could absolutely now improve this situation. What is the mechanism? It's very simple as shown nicely by the picture previously presented by Ravier. We have similar uh, CT scan in uh, adult as shown here. Immediately, less than one minute, you have developed atelectasis in the dependent part of the lung. This is a classical slide that you show. One simple way to avoid this is to maintain a positive pressure to avoid the collapses of the alveoli. And this was done early by just put six centimeters of water of continuous airway positive pressure during the pre-oxygenation. That's avoid to collapse of the alveoli and then improve oxygenation. This was true in CPAP, that means one positive pressure is PIP. And recently we developed uh, this, uh, the similar one, using uh, the ventilator of, uh, in anesthesia because now the anesthesia ventilator have similar performance than ICU ventilator. And uh, we try to evaluate this in obese patients using non-invasive ventilation which associated pressure support between 8 to 10 centimeters and PIP level of 6 centimeters of water. And during 5 minutes, as see here, we increase significantly more the expiratory oxygen, which is surrogate of the oxygen storage, and we reach more rapidly the highest level. This is safe. We have no problem if you never exceeded 15 centimeters of water in total airway pressure, that means PSV plus PIP. We confirmed this study in another large study with uh, our group with Emmanuel Futi and Jean-Michel Constantin. And shown here, this, we performed this with a lung volume and oxygenation is the same study, but after we have also a uh, um, hypoxemia occurred than what we suggest to after perform the recruitment maneuver to reopen uh, the lung in this type of patient. More recently, we have similar study using no CPAP, no non-invasive ventilation, but use the high oxygen flow. And the other conclude that with high oxygen flow, we can obtain very similar and close um, results than um, CPAP. Then, and more recently in ICU, we developed a new concept called Optiniv. Optiniv because we combine the high flow oxygen and non-invasive ventilation. We combine the two strategy. We use pre-oxygenation for non-invasive ventilation which allowed by the positive pressure to make alveolar recruitment and also during the laryngoscopy during the procedure we used the continuous insufflation of oxygen that uh, the thrill and then we have apneic oxygenation applied this is absolutely very different than previously now we observe it no more uh, oxygen desaturation because we open the line by an IV before and you maintain a uh, continuous flu, uh, flow of oxygen which allowed to decrease the desaturation. This is very new and we uh, validated it uh, in this uh, study which it was a blended study which allowed as shown here this is oxygen during the procedure we observed less oxygen desaturation in uh, very severe hypoxemic ICU patients. That means now we, this, the studies are going on for the obese patients. Then the pop ventilation have a second component during the procedure of surgery, during intraoperative. This is a paper that changed the practice. It's the improved study, this uh, study aimed to show that protective ventilation, which combine 
limited tidal volume of 7 mL per kilogram, PIP of 7 cm of water, and a recruitment maneuver around 7 during the surgery procedure. And this is, was the standard of care at the period of the study. And as you see, the postoperative pulmonary complication decreased from 28 to 11 percent during the first week after surgery. This is the first study that showed for the first time that the anesthesiologist is almost important than the surgeon. This is very important to have a good surgeon, but a good anesthesiologist is probably equivalent in this situation. Then you should absolutely show this uh, uh, study here for your uh, surgeon to see that how much the ventilatory setting could influence the outcome of the patient. Then at the same time, we have another study which Provilo. Provilo compared two PIP level, low and high, but showed different uh, results because the study are different. And then the question is, PIP alone is not sufficient. Why? Because, in fact, we don't know how it works and what it works more. But the question is not what it works, but the answer is all works together. You cannot use only low PIP or low tidal volume or high PIP. You should apply all the multiple heat uh, uh, package. This is very important to understand this. And this was shown by different meta-analyses. I show this uh, one uh, most recent one showed that the recruitment maneuver alone or PIP alone is not uh, sufficient and you should absolutely apply it both. Why? I will try to explain this. I, I show you this because I don't have time. I show the CT scan. This is a, one of my best favorite study. This is a obese patients who have a surgery planned for bariatric surgery. And as you know, you have three group of patients, of 10 patients. First group, we receive, he will receive only a PIP of 10 cm of water. The second group will receive only recruitment maneuver. Recruitment maneuver performed by an insufflation of 55 cm of water using the balloon at during 10 seconds. And a third group, which I called gold standard, it's the association of recruitment maneuver, open the line, and PIP, which maintain the line open. This is a CT scan in spontaneous breathing before surgery and induction and anesthesia. This is immediately after induction, just one minute after induction. All the patients have been pre-oxygenated with balloon. And as you see here, all the patients developed atelectasis. And the atelectasis is more important in obese patients. Then the question, what happened? In the PIP group, you have no modification after applied PIP. In the recruitment maneuver, you have no reopening. This is easy to explain because you don't have time to reopen and PIP alone, it cannot be open. But as you see here, what happened? I ask you, the answer is simple. You need to put a recruitment maneuver and insufflation which allow an opening and to maintain the lung open by using a positive and expiratory pressure, a PIP. That's what happened. This is why this has been made five minutes after induction and the other performed a new CT scan 20 minutes after because they said maybe you have a time dependent. No for the PIP group, no for the recruitment maneuver, but it's remained correct for the gold standard associated both. This may explain what happened, what you do only one of the complement of the multifacet. Now, uh, to finish my uh, talk, I have a few messages. What the best PIP of, uh, what the best level of PIP in obese patient during surgery with healthy length? We don't have exactly the answer. We know that probably we need more than 8 or 10 centimeters. Now we have a very nice study performed uh, uh, by uh, the group of uh, PRONET uh, study. The PRONET study, uh, it's a, a group uh, um, leading by the ISA with uh, Paolo Pellozzi, Marcelo Gama, Marcus Schulz, and different uh, experts in ventilation. And this uh, study just finished, and we hope that the data will uh, be presented in the next uh, days or very uh, in the next uh, uh, probably month. And then the tidal volume. The second point is the second message. Tidal volume should be used according 
the predicted body weight, not the real body weight. Why? Because these two patients, two adult patients, as you see here, you have an obese patient, this you have a non-obese patient, but the lung volume of both are totally equivalent. Then you should never calculate the lung tidal volume using the total actual uh, weight, but the predicted body weight. This is the most simple for us. I'm an anesthesiologist. It's 8 minus 100 for men and 8 minus 110 for women. It's very simple. And then uh, what's the best mode? Volume control or pressure? It's absolutely the same if you use very similar um, airway pressure delivered in the alveoli. This is very simple. Now it's accepted. Then this slide uh, summarizes the main um, ventilator setting that you do. Which mode, pressure or volume, is totally equivalent? Which tidal volume, probably around 7 to 8 for the majority of the patient, depending, depending on the predicted body weight? Which P, probably between 8 to 10 today? But probably we should take into account driving pressure for the future or not. And probably we should go uh, uh, to individualize probably PIP for the future. Should we perform the recruitment maneuver? Yes, but associated to a PIP. Then, post-operative period, you should apply CPAP or NIV. We don't have time, but uh, it's in the component of the pop ventilation concept. This is very important, as shown by this uh, meta-analysis reported uh, that a benefit effect by using uh, uh, CPAP or uh, NIV in a post-operative period and decrease respiratory complication. This is mainly due by, as shown on the lung, the recruitment, as shown here, you know, but also by open the upper airway and you increase the area. Exactly, because this, the majority of these patients have an apnea syndrome and then have a narrowing of the upper airway. Then the take-home message in conclusion, this is my last slide, just if you can remember the three following things uh, I think we win. First of all, try to improve the pre-oxygenation using positive pressure by CPAP or non-invasive ventilation. Never exceeded high pressure, always less than 15 centimeters. And then uh, always limited tidal volume. Now you never, I think we should never see tidal volume the more than 10 and probably the base is between 7 to 8 predicted body weight, please. And uh, uh, PEEP should be set more than 8 to 10 centimeters of water for all obese patients and decrease uh, obviously limited uh, tidal volume and performed recruitment maneuver associated to the PEEP. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jabert, for this excellent talk. Any questions from the audience? I think there are not. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. I'm Luis Fernando Falcón from Brazil. Uh, congratulations about the lectures. So my question is, uh, how do you do in your clinical practice the recruitment maneuver, and how do you individualize to set the PIP in those obese patients? Because I understand that the PIP is very important, but up to now in the clinical trials, uh, Provilo and I prove it's not obese patient, I know, but there is no different and um, pulmonary complication in the postoperative period. So how do you individualize the use of the PIP? It's uh, absolutely a, a major question. In our clinical practices, we use two things. First of all, we use the balloon. Then we switch in manual ventilation. This is very simple. Yep. And we put the APL valve at, in the, the reality, you have always five centimeters of security. That means if you put it at 40 centimeters of water, it's limited to 35 centimeters. That we do, 40 centimeters. Okay. And we insufflated the balloon. We check on the waveform on the screen, and we, for the uh, improved study or the other, on, we perform this for less than uh, 30 seconds, between 30 to 35 seconds, according to the patient. That's why it's, uh, the study was performed in a very sick patient at high risk, performed by an iris cat score. Yeah. And then we have, for this uh, study, we have a uh, monitoring of arterial pressure, or we try to check because sometimes if you have an hepatectomy, that probably is difficult. But 
if you have no problem of volemia, that means you have a good fluid challenge before, then we perform this for 30 to 40 seconds, and we observe it, the plateau pressure before and the plateau pressure after. If your recruitment is responder positive, you have a decrease of a plateau pressure. If you have a decrease of plateau pressure, that means you have a recruitment which performed. If you have no change of recruitment, if you have no change of plateau pressure, that means probably it's not enough and you should reperform again. This is the first situation. The second one, if you have, for example, in the Draeger machine, you can switch in pressure support ventilation mode rapidly and you put at 30, 35, and you put no peep or few peep, never exceeded the 14, and you do the same thing. You, you trig on the, ba on the balloon, and you have for this time during 30 seconds. That's we performed it. Perfect. And it's different than in the Brazil. You have you come from the Brazil? The Brazil, you have, uh, the, in Brazil, they have absolutely different because they use high pressure yep. and low time. They prefer use, uh, they choose to use between 16, uh, centimeter and for uh, 10 seconds. This is another approach. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I have a question about uh, doing an induction with a PEEP on a, an obese patient because we usually do a rapid sequence induction on morbidly obese patients and if I use a PEEP during this induction they'll probably have my head. So did you have any adverse effects, uh, such as aspirations when using PEEP? No, you have absolutely no side effect if you apply the, all uh, the, the concept. That means the pre-oxygenation is performed before induction. Yeah. Then the patient is awake. You try to put uh, a chair position, bench chair position. You try to perform uh, pre-oxygenation during at least three minutes. If you can, you do four minutes, okay, that the patient is spontaneously breathing. And at the end of your pre-oxygenation, you try to reach an end expiratory oxygenation more than 95%, probably you can more, and then you, uh, you make the induction. And this you make if you induction, you observe it on the ventilator, the apnea, and when you have an apnea, you could at this time uh, make your induction by using, uh, I don't know if you use or not the Selic maneuver, this is another controversy. And we have no problem if you use not high pressure. The only complication, if you use more than 12 or 40 centimeters, you can have this complication and uh, you try to avoid in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have a, f a question about your OptiNiv uh, approach. So you do the non-invasive CPAP, then the patient is induced, you take off the face mask and then you put on the high flow, or do you have the corrugated tube already with a face mask? Then you risk losing the seal, I think, and uh, patient discomfort maybe? Yes, yes, you're right. Sorry, I passed very fast because we don't have time. In fact, we put the oxygen nasal cannula before pre-oxygenation, that we put it, we put the flow at 15 liter minute, and we put the mask above uh, uh, more than uh, the opti flow. Then we have few leaks, but no problem for the ventilator because the pre-oxygenation lasted three to four minutes. We have no problem. Then after, when we remove the facial mask, we have in place the opti flow by the nasal oxygen calina. We put it before, and then we have the oxygen uh, delivering uh, flow, and we can perform the laryngoscopy under oxygen uh, flow delivering. Is it more clear? Yeah, but you have to be very careful then, I think, yes. not to, to tell your colleagues who are doing it, not to have a tight-fitting face mask because yes, you risk barotrauma and stomach inflammation. Yes, but we do exactly the same thing. We use yeah. a setting of never, never, never exceeded 15 centimeters of total pressure. That means oh. PEEP plus uh, uh, pressure support. The, the majority of the case, we use PEEP of 5 centimeters and pressure support ventilation level at 8 centimeters of water. And what's your opinion? Do you think non uh, the OptiFlow technique for pre-oxygenation will replace the archetypical uh, three-minute, 100% face mask spontaneous ventilation? OptiNiv is absolutely very, very, very new. Okay. We just now have uh, the uh, first study and uh, the study are coming. It's absolutely new. 
And just a different question, because we have you up here. What's your opinion on permissive hypercapnia, like levels 7.2 or 7.1 pH? Because it's quite hard to find a definite in, number in the in, literature. Uh, the question is for what type of patient? For RDS, for obese, for what? If we're taking ICU ventilation protective strategies into the OR? I think we don't have time to discuss this okay. point because I think we need uh, more than five hours to discuss this point. But uh, I like uh, hypercapnic permissive because it's the strategy of uh, lung protective ventilation. You decrease ventilation, that you, you increase uh, this. Yeah, so we have two minutes instead of five hours left, so please the last question for today. <laughs> well, just uh, one uh, um, maybe comment or question or whatever. I always, uh, I'm always bothered with uh, these studies uh, in uh, nowadays with individual patient care. When you have groups with uh, PEEP plus 4 and PEEP plus 8 and then uh, proving uh, no difference or a little difference because it's such a sh heterogenic groups. Uh, plus four may be working for somebody, not working. But, so what we are actually proving is that plus four is not working for everybody, same as plus eight is not working for everybody. So uh, what can you comment on uh, making uh, studies in the future about that? And uh, the other thing is we are talking only about healthy lungs. When can we expect some results on uh, lungs that uh, have some kind of uh, uh, pathology and uh, what will we do in the future for them? Thank you very much. I think your question is the best one because the answer is very easy. I think exactly the same thing like you. That means we should do absolutely in the future individualization of setting probably not only for the PEEP, but for other. Now the next study that are in progress, all are, say, are, are what you said. That means is we compared a fixed level of, I don't know, PEEP, of tidal volume, of something, in comparison to individualized level of PEEP, for example. And this, the individualized of PEEP, is the future. We don't know what is the best tool. Probably we can use easily now the driving pressure to try to limit the driving pressure with the high speed. Uh, maybe we can use some lung imaging. I don't know. For example, uh, uh, we can use uh, EIT. Uh, for example, in some obese patients, we have two or three studies about this. It's very interesting. Dreger uh, have another one and other companies develop this for the future. Some use the ultrasound, some other just uh, mechanics simple, other use uh, esophageal pressure, pressure. All in the same aim is to have an individual speed because as you clearly said, four centimeters can work for you and not for me and vice versa. And this is the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. for attending. I think I'm